Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. This is section 8.2, which is the introduction to composite and inverse functions. The first thing we're going to look at is a composite function. Now, honestly, composite functions is something we use on a regular basis. Maybe we're thinking about uh, a utility bill. We have to pay our utility bill. We can use a composite function kind of to think of it in terms of how many hours do I have to work in order to pay my utility bill. We're taking something in terms of dollars and our hourly rate in terms of dollars. So we have the same input. And we're thinking of it, how many hours do I have to work to pay a bill? That's actually an application to a composite function. So what is a composite function? Well, a composite function is where I have a function. And here we have an illustration of a function machine. My input of x, if I put it into a function, in this case g, my output is g of x, the function evaluated for the input of x. But what if I were to take that output of one function and use its value in another function? Its output will be the function evaluated for an entire value from another function. And this is what's called a composite function. It's where we evaluate a function with an entire another function. So what we have is in this uh, illustration here is the function of f being evaluated for the entire function g of x. Another way to write that, another notation, is f of g of x. This is not multiplication. This is just a notation, a symbol, that indicates the composition of f and g, or the composition of two functions. Now, the reason why they are the same notation and they can be equal is because of the way they're read. When we read a function like f of x or g of x, we read this the same way, f of g of x or f of g of x. This is read the exact same way, f of g of x. This doesn't mean any mathematical operations. It just means the composition of these functions is evaluated for x. So don't make the mistake of thinking you have to multiply this through. This is not a mathematical operation. It's just notation. So let's see an example of how we apply composite functions. Let's let f of x equal x plus 4, which is a linear equation. And it has a domain of all real numbers. And g of x equals x squared minus 4. This is a parabola. Its domain is also all real numbers. So the domain of one function has to be within the other function that we're going to plug it into to evaluate it. So our domains have to agree. If, in this example, if g of x is not a value within the domain of f of x, we cannot use it in that function. So, We've already determined their domain. The domain of both of these is all real numbers. They have no domain restrictions. So any value I get from one function, I can put into the other function. So we're going to find the composite functions of f of g of x. And to do that, essentially, we're going to take the function g and plug it into f. Now, one thing about this notation is we do have to kind of work it backwards. We're going to take the function g of x and put it in to f of x. If we look at this notation, this one is one that I prefer because it shows the entire function g of x being evaluated within the function of f. This one, we actually have to work backwards. g of x in to f of x from right to left instead of left to right. But it's just notation, so we do have to be familiar with it. So to find this composite function, I'm going to find f of g of x. So I'm going to take uh, f, which is x plus 4, and I'm going to evaluate that for g of x, which is x squared minus 4. And hopefully we can see that all I did was replace this x with the entire function g of x. And now I'm going to simplify that. Well, x squared minus 4 plus 4, well, negative 4 and positive 4 reduce to 0 or add to 0, which leaves me with just x squared. So the composite function of f of g of x is x squared. 
let's find the composite function of g of f of x. Now, the reason why I'm doing both of these is because order does matter. And we'll see that as soon as we're done with this example. If I'm finding g of f of x, I'm going to take the function f of x and evaluate g of x for that entire function. So g of x is x squared minus 4. And I'm going to evaluate it for f of x, which is x plus 4. So now, to simplify this, notice I have to follow order of operations. This quantity in these parentheses has to be squared before I can add or subtract. So if I square this out, I would get, and hopefully you know if we FOIL this binomial, we'll get x squared plus 8x plus 16 minus 4. So just to skip a few steps, I'm going to get x squared plus 8x plus 16 minus 4 is going to give me 12. x squared plus 8x plus 12. Hopefully, we can see that x squared and x squared plus 8x plus 12 are two totally different functions. And that's why I said earlier that f of g of x is different than g of f of x. The order matters. So let me just make a note of that. f of g of x is not equal to g of f of x. If it is, it's only by coincidence or a special case, which we'll see later when we introduce inverses. All right, so let's evaluate f of g of 2. This is saying, well, our input is going to be 2, so I would replace that. Now, I could do uh, plug this value into this function, take what I get out of that, and plug it into this function to find the final answer to f of g of 2. But that's going to be a lot of work. The thing is, I've already found f of g of x, which was x squared. I can now find f of g of 2 by simply evaluating this composite function, this new function. And if I do that, x squared, I evaluate it for 2, I get 2 squared. Well, 2 squared is 4. That's a lot less work than having to plug it into this value, find that, plug it into this value to finally get to the answer of 4. Now, g of f of 2, if I want to evaluate that, same thing. I don't have to plug it into this one and then this one. I already have the function right here. This function is the composite function of g of f of x. So I can plug in 2. 2 squared is 4 plus 2 times 8 is 16. 4 plus 16 is 20. 20 plus 12 is 30. So we saved a little bit of time by plugging it into the composite function of g of f. Now, just to show you that this is a true statement, that f of g of x is not the same as g of f of x, we can see that f of g gave us 4 when we evaluated it for 2, and g of f gave us 32 when we evaluated for 2. They are different values, even though we had the same input. They had different outputs. They're different functions altogether. So let's look at an uh, application of where we might use a composite function. Here it says, a store advertises a sale that takes 10% plus another $5 off already reduced prices. A sweater is already marked 20% off. Use a composite function to represent the cost of the sweater after all of our uh, rebates or deductions here for this sale. Well, if we're going to use a composite function, we need two functions. So I'm going to say my first function, f of x, is going to be the initial statement. What they're advertising is they take 10% off. So let's say we have this sweater. I don't know what the cost of the sweater is. I'm going to call that x. They're going to take 10% off, which is 0.01. We know how to work with uh, that, plus another $5 we're going to reduce. This is a function. The cost, uh, oh, actually, I got to change that up a bit. If we're taking 10% off, we're actually going to pay 90%. So this is what we're going to pay. So that's a little shortcut. 0.9x or 90% is what we pay, minus 5 more dollars. Our other function says 
we're going to take 20% off the cost of that sweater. Well, we're dealing with the same sweater, and I'm letting x represent the sweater. I'm going to take 20% off that sweater. So how much am I going to pay? Well, if I'm taking 20% off, I'm going to pay 80% of its value, the cost of that sweater. So now that I have two functions, let's think about the order, because order does matter, as I had mentioned before. If I have a sale price that takes it off of the already reduced price, this says I want to have the composite function of f evaluated for g of x. And the reason why that is is because I would have to remove the 20% so that it would be already reduced, and then plug it into this function so I can get my additional 10% off minus $5. So if we find this composite function, I'm going to take the function of f and evaluate it for g of x. And we can do a little bit of simplification here. 0.9 times 0.8 is 0.72 minus 5. So this is my composite function. 0.72x minus 5 more dollars. So I can go into the store now and look at this advertised price. And I could grab that sweater off the rack. And I could say, well, if this is the cost of the sweater, I can put it into my composite function. And I know how much I'm going to pay before taxes before I even get to the register. So I can make sure I'm getting the deal that they advertise. So we want to be educated consumers. All right, so let's look at inverse uh, functions or inverse relations to begin with. Now, this is much like our function machine that we just saw. However, when we look at this, notice this isn't a function in here. I have it written as a relation and the inverse of a relation. Now, the reason why it's a relation is because all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. And so essentially, what we're going to look at when we deal with inverses is if I have an input and I put it into some relation, I'm going to get some output. And let's call that output y. If I put that y value, my output from this relation, into an inverse of that relation, it essentially undoes the math or the work that was done to give me back my original input. So essentially what an inverse is, is if we have a function that would give us ordered pairs of x, y, the inverse says, well, if I plug in y, I'm going to get back out x. One will undo the other. So let's look at this relation. We have ordered pairs, the set of ordered pairs, negative 3, negative 27, negative 2, negative 8, negative 1, negative 1, 0, 0, and 2, 8. These are our set of ordered pairs. To, what we need to do is first determine, is it a function? Well, if we recall a test that we learned way back when, it's called the vertical line test. The vertical line test, if we had the graph of a function, is a vertical line. And if it only crosses our function's graph one time in any spot we place it, it is a function. Well, essentially what that means is the x value cannot repeat. If the x value does not repeat, it is a function. So is this a function? Well, I have x values of negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 2. They are all unique values of x. This is a function. So let's find its inverse. Well, the inverse, like I said, will undo any ordered pair simply by switching the input and the output. So if I want to find the inverse of this relation, all I have to do is replace my x's for y's and my y's for x's. So my first ordered pair in the set for our inverse will be negative 27, negative 3, the inverse of this ordered pair, switching x and y. My next point would be negative 8, negative 2. We, again, we just flip them. Here, if I exchange negative 1 with negative 1, well, it just happens to be the same. 
Same thing with 0, 0, the origin. Well, x and y are the same values. So if I switch them, it's still the same. The last one, however, my y is 8 and my x is 2. So in its inverse, my x is 8 and the y is 2. Now, we can ask the same question. Is this a function? Well, we just assessed, does the x value repeat, our new x value? So we have negative 27, negative 8, negative 1, 0, and positive 8. They're all unique values, so this is also a function. Let's look at another example. Here we have the relation of negative 3 and 9 as an ordered pair, 4 and negative 2, negative 1 and 1, 2 and 4, 3 and 9. Is this a function? Well, if I look at my x values, I see they are all unique, negative 3, 4, negative 1, 2, and positive 3. They're all different values. None of them repeat. So I can find its inverse. And if I do that, I just have to switch my x's for y. So my first point is 9, negative 3. The next one is negative 2, 4. The next one is 1, negative 1, 4, 2, and lastly, 9, 3. So let's ask us if this is a function. Well, I have 9, negative 2, 1, 4, and 9 for my x values in this inverse. The 9 is repeating. It's not a unique value. This relation is not a function. So now you. Hopefully, you understand that first statement I made, where all functions are relations, but not all relations are functions. This wouldn't pass a vertical line test because it would go through two different values for x. The x repeats. All right, let's look at what exactly an inverse function is. Well, in order to find an inverse function, we have to first know a function. That function has to be one to one. And what that means is, for every x value, for every input value, there is a unique output value. To be a one-to-one -one function, just like we saw before, the x value can't repeat in order to be a function. But in order for it to be a one-to-one -one function, the y value cannot repeat as well. For every unique x, there is a unique y. No values are going to repeat. Now, that is the definition of a one-to-one -one function. And this is what we need to have in order be, to be able to find a function's inverse. So let's first introduce the notation of a function's inverse. We're already familiar with f of x. This is function notation. Well, an inverse function, we use a negative 1 exponent in between the function and x. It is not a mathematical operation. It is just notation. It is read as the inverse of f of x. So it's just indicating inverse. We know a negative exponent <coughs> means to take its reciprocal or inverse. So this is just saying it's inverse. It doesn't mean you actually mathematically flip it. Don't do that. So let's look at two examples. And I'm going to introduce a new test similar to the vertical line test. Now, if I were to use the vertical line test on f of x equals x squared, and we can see that with a vertical line anywhere on this graph, it only intersects once per any vertical line. This is a function. But is its inverse a function? Is this function one to one? To determine if this is one to one, I can draw a horizontal line. Well, this horizontal line says there is a repeating y value, which means it's inverse. Because if we think about a vertical line, its inverse would be a horizontal line. So we can see that it, its inverse is not a function. This f of x equals x squared is not a one-to-one -one function. So its inverse is not a function, only a relation. Let's look at this one right here, f of x equals x cubed. Is this a function? Well, if I did the vertical line test, anywhere I draw a vertical line, it only intersects it in one spot, no matter where I draw it. So it is a function. 
But what about its inverse? Would its inverse be a function? Is this one to one? Well, if I draw a horizontal line, it only intersects the graph once. And no matter where I put that, it's only going to intersect our graph once. So it passes the vertical line test, telling me it is a function. It passes the horizontal line test, telling me that if I find its inverse, it too will be a function because it's one to one. For every unique x, there is a unique y. So let's uh, review what a function is and its inverse. Well, an inverse is replacing inputs and outputs. So if we have a function that has ordered pairs x, y, its inverse would essentially have ordered pairs y, x. We'd switch those values. So our output of our original function is now our input. And that gives us back, as an output, the original input of the function. So how do we find these values algebraically? Well, if we look at finding an inverse of a function, we think about uh, undoing the math, because one function will undo the other. Well, what's happening in this function? We have a linear function, f of x equals 3x plus 7. What are we doing to the input value? Well, this input value, I'm going to multiply it by 3 and add 7. Whatever value I put in, that's the math I'm going to do. So to undo that, to get that input back, I would have to undo that math. So instead of multiplying by 3, at some point I would divide it by 3. Instead of adding 7, I would subtract 7, undo the math. So how do we do that algebraically? Well, if we know an inverse replaces an x value with a y and a y value with an x, as it says here, let's do that. f of x is just a y value, so I'm going to replace it with an x. And my x value, I'm going to replace it with a y. Now, the inverse function is essentially found by solving this for y. So if I solve this for y, well, I need to subtract 7. I need to undo that math. So I get x minus 7 equals 3y. To get y by itself, I have to undo this multiplication. I need to divide by 3. If I divide both sides by 3, I get x minus 7 quantity divided by 3 equals y. This is my inverse function. So now I can use that notation we introduced. The inverse of this function is f inverse of x is equal to what this y was equal to, x minus 7 divided by 3. So we found the inverse and its function. For a moment, we're going to move over to this board here. Kind of gave you a preview of what's to come. And look at their graphs. This yellow line is f of x equals 3x plus 7. That was my function that I started with. If its inverse is every point where the x's and y's are interchanged, we would get this line right here, also a linear equation. Now, let's see if that's true. If I look at this one and I say, well, what's the y-intercept right here? Well, if I set this equal to 0, I would say, OK, well, if x is 0, 3 times 0 is 0, plus 7. This is the point 0, 7. Now, what about its inverse? Well, its inverse has this point right here. Well, this is if I set the equation equal to 0, because I want the y value to be 0 instead of the x value. This is going, if I set this equal to 0, I'd multiply both sides by 3 and then add 7. I get 7, 0. If we look at these points, they are on each graph, respectively, but they are the inverse. Now, there's another line on here, and it's called the identity function. And it's simply the equation of a line where y equals x, the linear equation y equals x. We call this the identity function because y identifies x. If I were to find its inverse, I'd switch the x and y values. It hasn't changed. It's, I've identified itself as its own inverse. x equals y is the same thing as y equals x. So this tool can actually be used when we look at any other inverse. If I have some point on a function, 
its inverse is going to be a reflection through y equals x. So the distance here is the same as the distance there. So if I only had one of these graphs, I could simply reflect it to the other side. Here's another example. If I have a point here, it is the same distance as the point here. So we can use y equals x as a tool to graph functions, especially when they may get a little bit more complicated than a linear equation, and we need to find the inverse function. So let's go back to this board for a moment and say, well, here we have something that's not linear. How do I find its inverse? I use the exact same process. I need to undo the math. So I'm going to replace f of x, which is a y value, with an x value. And my x value, I replace with a y value. So hopefully we can see we just replace those values with their inverse, x and y, y and x. And now I need to solve this for y, just like I had solved that for y. Well, I need to subtract 2 from both sides. And to get rid of uh, power of 3, I can take the cubed root of both sides. Since it's a cubed root, I don't worry about plus or minus, because that would give me two repeating values for x, which wouldn't be a function. So I wouldn't have to worry about that. But this cube, I can take the cube root plus or minus doesn't matter. So I get the cube root of x minus 2. The cube root of y cubed is just y. This is my inverse function. Now I can write it using the notation. f inverse of x equals the cube root of x minus 2. So let's look at this function and the graph of its inverse. And we'll see that identity function still holds true. So if we look at this here, again in yellow, f of x equals x cubed plus 2. That is my original function. And we can see that's this right here. A cubic function looks like that. If we look in the orange, our inverse, which was the cubed root of x minus 2, we can see that curve. Now again, I put y equals x on this graph so we can see that comparison. If we look at these values, anything above y equals x is reflected below it. We see that symmetry through y equals x. So these are inverses. If I look at this intercept here, which is 0, 2, I know that this intercept here of its inverse is 2, 0. Every point is flipped for its inverse. X values become y. Y values become x when we find an inverse function. All right, so there should be a way in math that we can always be able to check our work. So what we're going to do here is we're going to flip this board over like magic and have a whole new board with an example of each of those in there. Here, what we have is composite notation. We just talked about that at the start of the video. Here is the one example where order doesn't matter. This is when we take the composite function and its inverse. So if we compose a function with its inverse, we undo all the math to get our original input. If we recall our function machine of an inverse, if we put in an input into a function, we get out an output, we take that output into its inverse, we get the input value that we originally started with back. So if I do a composite function of its inverse, I will get x. It has to equal x. Well, here we have the composite function. f is my function that I'm going to put the entire function f inverse of x into. So instead of 3x plus 7, I have 3 and the whole function inverse, x minus 7 over 3 plus 7. And if we simplify this, something is going to happen where it's just going to equal x. That verifies that I have actually found a function and its inverse. So let's go ahead and do this. If I multiply this quantity by 3, the 3 is reduced to 1, leaving me with x minus 7 plus 7. Well, negative 7 plus 7, if I combine like terms, they become 0. x and 0 is just x. This shows me, using a composite function, 
that I have the function and its inverse. I checked my work. I'm sure I did it right. This has to be the inverse of this function. Let's look at the other function that we found its inverse. And notice I'm putting the inverse function first and the uh, original function second, meaning I'm going to compose the inverse function with f of x. And it will equal x. This is the only time where order doesn't matter. If I put in f and f inverse, or if I put in f inverse and f, this is the time where order doesn't matter. Otherwise, if it's two different functions that are not inverses, this does not hold true. So I have the, in orange, I have the inverse function uh, cubed root of x minus 2. I'm going to evaluate that function for, in the yellow, f of x, which was x cubed plus 2. Now, if I simplify this, we have 2 and negative 2. Well, that reduces to 0. So I just have x cubed. The cubed root of x cubed, well, if I take the cubed root of a perfect cube, I get that base, which is just x. So I know that this is the inverse of this function. So I've checked my work using a composite function. So definitely, if you're asked to find the inverse of a function, once you've found it, use this composite uh, function of its inverse and make sure that it simplifies to the original input of x. So this has been section 8.2, Introduction to Composite and Inverse Functions. Keep working that homework. And thank you for watching.